Welcome to St. Stephen's Presbyterian Church. Our our prayer is that God will bless you and comfort you you and speak to you as you worship with us today. To the lectionary, which we used at the beginning of the year until we started this series, Hope in the Darkness. And one of the readings from this Sunday is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 
verse 9 to 13. And it's a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. And on the website esv.org, the author says the following about the background to the first letter to the Thessalonians. The first regarding the author and the date and the recipients is Paul wrote this letter to the church in Thessalonica. He probably wrote it between AD 49 and 51. He was in Corinth and he was on his second missionary journey, which we can read about in Acts chapter 18. And the main theme in this letter is Jesus' second coming. When he returns, the dead who have believed in Christ will rise and will join the living to meet the Lord in the air. Unbelievers will experience God's wrath, while believers will inherit salvation. And in preparation for that great day, Christians are called to be holy and blameless, and God who is faithful will produce in them the holiness that He requires. And the purpose of this letter is that Paul has received a report from Timothy about the Thessalonian church, and Paul writes to them, to restore their hope which has been tested by unexpected deaths in the church. And he reassures them that both the dead and the living believers will be safe at the second coming. In addition, Paul wants to stress the authenticity of himself, Silas and Timothy, as preachers of the gospel, to teach them that persecution is normal for Christians and to challenge them to take responsibility for earning their own living. We see that in chapter 4. And so I'm going to read to you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, some verses, and also 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Firstly, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. For you know that we dwelt with you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, from verse 3. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service, in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted, and it turned out that way. As you well know, for this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live, since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you, in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. This morning I want to ask you three questions. The first question is, what does a disciple of Jesus look like? What does a disciple of Jesus look like? And secondly, who are the people who have made an impact in your life? The people who have discipled you, the people who have mentored you. And thirdly, what does making disciples look like? So firstly, how do you know whether you're a disciple of Jesus? And the first thing I'm going to say is you are living a life Worthy of God, who calls you into His kingdom and glory. A disciple, according to Paul, is someone who's living their life worthy of God. Someone who's been invited into the kingdom and glory of God and becomes an ambassador for God on this earth. 
someone who God would be proud of because of the way that they're living in th their lives. When people look at disciples of Jesus, they see that there's something different about us. We represent the king on earth. Secondly, you are filled with faith and love. When we have faith, we believe that God can do something even when we don't see any evidence of that. When we have faith, we believe that God wants to do a new thing at St. Stephen's. Even though things feel doom and gloom sometimes, God can do what we cannot do. When we have faith, we believe that God wants to use us to make disciples in Rosettenville and Glen Vista and Linma and other suburbs around us. And even though we feel totally inadequate for the job, we can't do anything on our own, but God can do amazing things through us. When we have faith as small as a mustard seed, we can move mountains. And the task that we have before us feels like a mountain, but God. A disciple of Jesus is filled with love. And Jesus says that, we'll, that they will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. Jesus says a new commandment I give you, love one another the way that I love you. And here is the important thing. You can't love one another if you don't know each other. And you can't get to know people if you just say hello and goodbye on a Sunday. In order to love one another, we need to have meals together in each other's homes. We need to be in Bible study groups together. We need to share our lives with one another. We need to serve in teams together. We need to be vulnerable with one another. And my prayer is that next year our faith will grow and our love for one another will grow. Thirdly, if you're a disciple of Jesus, you will stand firm against the attacks of the enemy. You will be ready for the attacks. You will have the armor and the weapons that you need to stand firm. You will be part of a platoon that is fighting and defending together. You will be like a plant that is not choked by the weeds. You will be like a ship that is not tossed about by the waves. Whatever the enemy throws your way, you will be ready for the attack and you will stand firm. You will not retreat, but hold your position. Fourthly, a disciple of Jesus will have a desire to keep growing. A disciple of Jesus will move on from drinking milk to mashed up vegetables and eventually to steak. A disciple of Jesus will go from a dependent baby to an exploring toddler to a confident child and eventually a strong teenager and an adult. A disciple of Jesus will not stagnate. We will never reach full maturity, but we, con we do continue to grow and learn. A disciple of Jesus will love other Jesus followers more and more. Loving other people means caring for each other. It means apologizing to each other. It means getting upset with each other, but then resolving the conflict. Loving each other means encouraging each other. Loving each other means being patient with one, with one another. And then a disciple of Jesus is holy and blameless in the presence of God the Father. We are not holy and blameless because of anything we've done. We are holy and blameless because of the blood of Jesus. We are holy and blameless because we are dressed and covered with the goodness of God. I want to say this. We can't measure spiritual maturity by how often someone comes to a worship service every month. We can't measure spiritual maturity by how involved someone is in the ministry and the life of St. Stephen's because spiritual matur maturity has to do with the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. When we are loving and kind and gentle, when we are self-control, when we are filled with joy, when we are filled with peace, when we are patient, that's how we know that someone is a mature disciple of Jesus. But a disciple of Jesus is also willing to accept the mission that Jesus has given us to go and make disciples of all nations. A disciple of Jesus will want to be part of this mission team. A disciple of Jesus will want to spend time with other followers of Jesus. A disciple of Jesus will love, will love other followers of Jesus. And it's possible to attend a church service on a Sunday and not be a disciple of Jesus. It's possible to be involved in greeting people at the door, or teaching Sunday school, or operating the projector on a Sunday, and not be a disciple of Jesus. It's possible to play in the worship team and not be a disciple of Jesus. 
a disciple of Jesus has encountered God and is filled with the Holy Spirit and starts to become like Jesus. This, the fruits of the Holy Spirit start to become evident in their lives. And so who are the people that have made an impact in your life? The people who have discipled you? Someone who comes to mind for me is a man named Terence Berzelman, who was one of my Sunday school teachers, and he befriended us Ash kids. And we would go to his house and play computer games, and he would record songs on a tape for me, some of the music I liked. And Terence was a Sunday school teacher who went above and beyond just teaching lessons. He became a friend to my sister and my brother and I. And then Daryl Henning. I first met Daryl when he was a speaker on a scripture union camp. And I went on a few camps with him and he was someone I looked up to. When I went to Cornerstone Christian College, he was one of my lecturers and we looked at a book called The Lost Art of Disciple Making. And when Daryl moved to Old Mutual and when, when I became a youth pastor at Somerset West United Church, I drove through and had lunch with Daryl a few times. Daryl has gone back to work with Scripture Union and I phone him every now and again. He's one of my cheerleaders. He was a camp leader who took the time to get to know me. And then there's Andy Barnard. I met Andy Barnard at Carmel Easter Camp, which was a major, major turning point in my life. And he came and preached at Goodwood Presbyterian Church. He was the speaker on one of our church family camps. And our paths just kept on crossing. When I moved to Johannesburg, he was the pastor of an Assembly of God Church in Edenville. And I went and visited him. He came to speak at Grand Park Ridge United Church. And he's another camp leader who took the time to get to know me and spoke into my life. And then Alan Noble. In 1990, I went to Cape Technicon and got involved in the YMCA on campus. I attended Bible studies. I went on a hike in the Cedarburg. I did the Evangelism Explosion 3 course with Alan by my side, walking over to total strangers in the passage of Cape Technicon and sharing the gospel with them. And my short time at Cape Technicon was a time of growth, a time when the Bible came alive to me. And then Tom Main. When I moved to Rand Park Ridge United, a man named Tom Main became my mentor. And almost every week for 10 years, we had breakfast together at Bwumpi. He invested in me. He mentored me. He admonished me sometimes. He taught me about leadership. Through good times and tough times, he walked with me. There were many others who've impacted, many others who invested me. Who invested in you? Who has mentored you? Who has discipled you? Maybe it was a Sunday school teacher or a Bible study leader or a minister who saw potential in you. I'm pretty sure that if you spoke to Brian and Pitt and Wendy, each of them would be able to point towards someone that impacted their lives. And of course, the people who have the biggest impact in our lives are our parents who pass their faith onto us. But what can we learn from Paul about making disciples? What does making disciples look like? We can look at both Jesus and Paul as the example of disciple makers. But this morning we're going to look mainly at Paul and how he continues to disciple the Thessalonians through his letters. The first thing we can see from the language that Paul uses is that he dearly loves these disciples of his in Thessalonica. When they are struggling, he's encouraged and comforting them. When he wants to challenge them, he urges them. And he uses more first forceful language. Because making disciples is not just about loving and caring for people. Sometimes it's about challenging people to make changes in their lives. Sometimes we even need to rebuke people when they are behaving in an unhelpful way. To be honest, making disciples is a lot like parenting. And that is certainly the kind of relationship that Paul has with his disciples. As parents, we disciple and mentor our children to become mature disciples of Jesus. As those involved in Sunday school or children's ministry, we teach and encourage children. When we lead Bible studies, it's not just about filling people with knowledge, but it's a desire to see people mature in their faith. Even teaching and preaching from the pulpit and devotions that go out on a Tuesday and Wednesday are ways in which we want to not only encourage and comfort you, but also urge you to grow and mature. And then 
When Paul can't be with them, he sends Timothy to strengthen and encourage them. Now, I can't lead and teach every Bible study, and I can't phone every member of the congregation every week, but I can encourage Tom and Colleen and Lorna as they make disciples in their groups, and I can make contact with those who are on the care and prayer team to find out how everyone is doing and whether there are any crises in people's lives. And through the care and prayer team, we have reg- we used to have regular updates about Yvonne when she was in hospital. Through the, the prayer and care team, I found out about the death of Annie's husband, Mike. Through Susan and the prayer and care team, I've had regular updates with Annette Cuthbert, who has a number had a number of falls, and I've been able to visit her. And Susan is visiting her regularly, almost daily. In the same way that Paul always had a team around him, I'm grateful to have a great team around me. People who care deeply for the members of this congregation. And I get to know all of you through them. And slowly but surely, I'm getting around to you in your homes and phoning you and getting to know you because I'm growing to love you as a congregation. And then Paul is also worried about them because he himself has been going through some trials and he's concerned that they might be worried about him. In fact, Paul has to flee Thessalonica at night because the Jews caused a riot. And it looks like Paul was in that city for about three weeks. And a man named Jason welcomes Paul into his home. And they come to Jason's house looking for Paul and they arrest Jason. But in those three weeks, Jason and the believers in Thessalonica, they grow to love Paul and they're concerned about him. And for three weeks, he preaches in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And for three weeks, he stays with Jason and has meals with him and other believers. And that's what making disciples looks like. But Paul is also concerned that the tempter, Satan the devil, will tempt them. Paul has invested in them. He wants them to become strong and not fall away. And new young Christians can easily fall away. They can be deceived by false teaching. Or maybe a sin gets a grip in their lives. Every parent knows that their little one is vulnerable when they're a baby or toddler. And these new believers that Paul is writing to are also vulnerable. They need to be protected from the evil one until they become stronger in their faith. And when Timothy brings good news and allays Paul's fears, and he hears about the faith and love, he's encouraged. And I'm sure that those ministers who have gone before me are also encouraged when they hear news of St. Stephen's and its members, when they hear of growth and maturity. The other day I had a video call with Rod Adamson, and he asked about you, and I think He was encouraged to hear news about you. At the time, Paul was experiencing persecution and hearing good news about his disciples in Thessalonica made his persecution and trials more bearable. Paul writes to them and says, We really live because you are standing firm in the Lord. And we must never forget that when we become followers of Jesus, we enter a spiritual battle. In Ephesians, when Paul writes about putting on the armor of God, he also talks about standing firm. And maybe in military terms, we would say, hold your position. Don't fall back when the enemy attacks. Defend using all the equipment that you've been given. And Paul sees that they are standing firm. They are not retreating when the enemy attacks. And Paul just seems to be filled with joy when he gets this report from Timothy. Hard times are ahead. For St. Stephen's. And so stand firm, just like the Thessalonians did. Don't retreat. Put on the full armor of God. We're in a spiritual battle. Expect the attacks to come. And then Paul says, We have joy in the presence of our God because of you. And he's almost saying, We don't even have enough words to express our thankfulness. Paul is filled with joy. And he is indicating that when he is in God's presence, that he is overjoyed because of the news that he is getting from Timothy. Now we can be in the presence of God just like Paul. Because the curtain in the temple was torn and we can enter the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could enter. And when you move from a disciple to a disciple maker, you need to spend time in God's presence. And when you see the progress of your mentees, you will also be encouraged. 
When I was at St. Mungo's, I had two interns, and both of them are involved in youth ministry at the moment. Rosie, one of the interns, has taken over from me at St. Mungo's, and as I chat to some of my friends at St. Mungo's, I'm hearing such encouraging reports about how Rosie is doing at St. Mungo's, despite it being a very challenging year, and it brings me great joy. I think she's doing a better job than I did, and that makes me excited. Internships are a great way of making disciples. And in fact, that is really what Paul did. Those young people that he took with him on his missionary journeys were his interns. He trained them up so that they too could become church planters and and spread the good news about Jesus and preach the gospel and establish new churches. And then lastly, Paul longs to see these disciples again. In fact, he's praying that he might see them again And he wants to keep teaching them and he wants them to keep growing. And he's saying to them, you've not arrived yet. There are some things that are still lacking in your faith. And I want to keep investing in you and teaching you and mentoring you so that you'll become strong and mature in the faith. Making disciples is about loving people. It's about walking a journey with people. Helping new Christians to grow, encouraging and, and urging them teaching them how to stand firm against the powers of the evil one. It's about seeing potential in people. It's about helping people discover their spiritual gifts. So firstly, are you a disciple of Jesus? Are you growing in your love for one another? Are you growing to maturity? Are you reading the scriptures and feeding yourself the bread of life? And then who are the people who have invested in your life? Those that have mentored you and discipled you. Thank them. Let them know the impact that they have had in your life. And then lastly, who are you mentoring? Who are you investing in? Who are you pouring your life into? Who are you teaching? Who are you praying for? Who do you take for breakfast or lunch? Maybe you feel totally inadequate. Good. So did Moses. So did Gideon. So did I the first time I got up to speak to a group of teenagers. So did I the first time I preached in my dad's congregation in Goodwood. When we feel inadequate, then we rely on God's power instead of our own. The great investment you can make, in my opinion, is in the children and teenagers of this congregation. Who's going to join Wendy and Princess? We're not asking you to be there every week. Offer to help once every three weeks. Get to know the names of the children. Get to know their parents. Find out what they love to do. Who's going to look after the babies and toddlers so that parents can have a break and sit in church to listen to the sermon and to worship? Jesus said, go and make disciples. And he was talking to you. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back the world behind me the cross before
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.